that recording has started. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to the January 2022 Microsoft 365 Modern Management Meetup. So that means that we've made it to another year. Uh, so a very belated Happy New Year to, to everyone. Um, and uh, my name's Mark O'Shea. I'll be pretty much running through most of the, the discussion today. Uh, but uh, for this one, because I'm sure a few of you have already done exams or have got questions about the exams, and maybe that's why you've joined uh, uh, today or tonight, depending on where you are, um, make sure that you know, whether you want to drop comments into chat or whether you feel like unmuting to ask the questions, please take advantage of that to make sure that it's just it's not just me talking you know, talking for, two, for the next two hours or so when, you know, it's going to be a lot more interesting for everyone if you've got questions that you want to ask. Um, and then that's potentially going to cover off some areas that I didn't think of to include in uh, in the content that I've put together. So I'll just hand over quickly to Steve. Hi, I'm Steve. How you going? <laughs> Mark's going to be running this meeting. He's talking about certs and, uh, and, yeah. and not cool certs. He's talking about sitting in classrooms and listening to Mark talk about technology. Yeah, and Ben is not here today. So so Ben gets the strike through treatment tonight because uh, he was- Well, he, he was would if you're sharing your screen for the presentation and not your downloads folder. Oh, okay. But it's an important thing that I'm downloading, the, the lab updated version of the lab kit. It's part of the demonstration. Look at that. Ta-da. I was, I was ready. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you for pointing that out two or three minutes into, into the session. Sorry, I, I thought you were um, intentionally presenting. No, that. no. I was looking, I was looking at the other at the other screen. Okay, so so let's jump in then. And it's just gonna be like you know, a you know, quick a quick run through of introductions, anyone who's new, and I guess also during the introduction section. Uh, I'd, I'd like to use that as an opportunity this time for the, any of you who are planning on doing any exams or thinking about them, just sort of drop into chat once we get into that section, what exams you're thinking of doing, just so that we can make sure that we do spend a bit of extra time on those as we go through. But because it's the beginning of the year, we're not really going to d dive into any of the technology changes, et cetera, that have taken place, because we really saw a lot of those announcements and discussed them uh, with the Ignite uh, session that we did late last year. So we've kind of been a little bit of a quiet period before we start ramping up again. So we'll just sort of really be focused on you know, things you need to think about when it comes to uh, you know, not just getting certified, but you know, really picking what exams you should be doing and if you're doing multiple exams, what are some of the smart ways to think about getting the best bang for buck out of those? So for your introductions, uh, so as I mentioned, if, you're, have, if you haven't joined us before, um, and uh, you know, I know we've got a few people from, you know, you know, basically we've got people from outside of Australia as well. So like if you haven't joined before, or if you're somewhere outside of Australia, just drop a comment into chat. If you are in Australia, even if you're in Canberra, Please feel free to <laughs> to advise where you are, Liam. <laughs> where you are, Liam. <laughs> do, do, do we allow Canberrians to uh, uh, get involved? Oh, we do. We do. Okay. Okay. Because Canberra keeps our country running. Yes, that's correct. Just remember, we're being recorded. Being yes. Oh, hi, hi, Liam. I see you from Canberra. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So we have Andy from London and we have uh, Steve from Switzerland. Wow. And I, and I saw earlier that we have uh, uh, Shaq23 from Chicago. Yeah. Wow. It must be yes. like somebody's got insomnia. <laughs> Yeah, normally, yeah, normally we don't see too many US-based people. We do get our fair share of uh, coffee drinking European <laughs> attendees because the timing is is good for them. Also, okay, so Minneapolis, Minneapolis, uh, so yeah, nice. So oh, we've even Chris, you go to uh, MMS out at the Mall of America. We have Italy, we have Auckland, we have Netherlands. Wow. 
Huge amount of people. We've, we've awesome. got two Ned we've got two Neil Netherlands people. So I yes. guess before we do kick off, um, I just want to say thank you to Jerome. He I sort of sent him through an early version of uh, the presentation that I'm using for tonight just to get him to go through and let me know if I missed anything. And because I think he's he's driving to a client while this is going on, so he's not really going to, going to be able to participate uh, as heavily as he'd like to. But uh, thank you very much. Don't don't type and don't text and drive Jerome. <laughs> So pay, pay attention to the road. Um, so, okay. So, Hello. <laughs> yeah, so, so, yeah. So, yeah. So, thanks for going through. I've incorporated uh, some of your feedback in. So, uh, so, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, there's no no shortage of things that we can uh, talk about uh, today. So I can just I can just see that Alvin's typing in something. So we'll just either that or he's just sort of highlighted the text item area and teams thinks he's typing. We've got an always, typing as well. always a fun one. And I guess Steve and I, yeah, we should both say like we are in Sydney. So we're on so if people aren't from Australia, but you know, there's probably two things that you you know about Australia because you've seen it, you've seen them in a lot of disaster movies. You know the Opera House and you know the Harbour Bridge. Um, and so Steve and I are basically on opposite sides of the Harbour Bridge uh, to each other. But he gets to see the water. I get to see my neighbour's brick wall. Oh, no, I get <laughs> to see the Blue Mountains from here. We don't have oh, okay. views of the water. Oh, that was oh you moved. Old, old oh, that place. was the other place. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, that apology was... for bringing back bad memories. Or for, oh, sorry, no. For no. bringing back good memories. Yeah. Good memories, yeah. 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 Give it time. Yeah. Give it time. I may, may find a place that has nice view again. Uh, yeah, Manly Beach is a bit yeah. of fun. Yeah. Okay, so so let's jump in then, and uh, we might as well, you know, get started just talking about the certification side. And I guess just to you know lay out the things that we're going to be mostly, and I say mostly, but not completely, but focused on things that relate to like managing through with like with Endpoint Manager. Uh, but also supporting exams that are probably good to uh, you know, give you some of the skills that you need to have conversations with people who might manage other parts of Microsoft 365 or Azure environments. So rather than you just going in as the endpoint manager person and you know, going, I don't care about this or that, or I don't know about this or that, uh, I'll go through and talk about how, you know, how some of these exams relate to each other. In a lot of cases, especially when we look at things like the MD exams and MS exams, there can be a ridiculous amount of overlap, which also means that it kind of makes sense to look at that overlap and say, if I'm preparing for this exam, maybe I should also prepare for this other exam at the same time because they've got 90% of, uh, of the same objectives, for example. And that's something that's getting, like, I, I wouldn't say it, it's common in exams, but it's something where now, um, like I do have to spend a lot more time these days explaining why you do have two exams that at first glance do look incredibly similar to each other. And I'll, I'll point a few of those out as we go through. So let's start off with just a few reasons that I put together as to why do people get certified. Now, if there's a reason that you can think of or something that applies to you that you can't think of, like drop it into chat or unmute to discuss it. But I want to start off with the first one, employer mandated, because this is probably the most unpleasant type of reason for people to get certified. When your manager comes to you and says, here's your objectives for the new year, and here are the certifications from Microsoft that you have to do. And you might work for an organization that has never done that before, and you've never had that kind of expect expectation. So while it's so while some people do panic when this occurs, I think like one of the things that I think I see the most when it is employer mandated training is yeah so 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 Liam yeah that's the category exam addiction in, um, is self motivated but with the employer mandated this is the one where I see probably the most stress overall and the reason why I think there's so much stress there is that 
Everybody in your team or your organization knows that you're going to do the exam. So there's a lot of pressure on you to prove that you've passed the exam by the date that's been set for you. And some of the things that have been interesting over the last couple of years have been seeing a lot of organizations that never really cared about certification uh, inside the organization previously, even though they may have that, that it's not that they discourage people from it, but it was never really a core part of you know of what the micro or sorry what the organization believed that their Microsoft focused people should be looking at. And this is something that over the last two to three years, especially with the introduction of the fundamentals exams, is um, that's probably the driving factor there. And there are some there's a lot of positives, but there's also some negatives there. I've seen some people who just really should not be doing exams, <laughs> doing exams. If someone fails a fundamentals exam five times, maybe that person in their role may not be the right target. Um, and it's, you know, those or, of you who... Or the other thing to call on that one, Mark, yeah. is that they're just not good at exams. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So they're, yeah, and that's the other thing as well. There are people who, who don't, don't fare well in exam situations. Um, and look, and even with some of these exams, I'll talk about like historically which of these exams, especially with fundamentals, like there was a fundamentals exam that had an atrocious pass rate from the people that I chatted to who did it. And I'll talk about, you know, some of the things that have improved over time uh, with that one. So, so with the employer mandated, the good thing is, is that it means that the organization benefits from a lot of people knowing a lot more. And if it means, if we look at things like Microsoft Partners, for example, that it's not just the technical people uh, need to get certified, but also now sales people need to do, or, say, or sales and marketing people need to do fundamentals exams. That is something that I, I think of as like, I don't think that's too much of a request of people because you really, if this is stuff that you're supposed to be talking about, you know, day after day, you really should be able to at least match the thing that you're talking about to what it actually does. Yeah. Yeah. So then, yeah. So then other things, yeah. So as Steve has just sort of typed in, so things like your, yeah. So basically your organization needs it for their gold or silver competencies, for example. Um, so that's, yeah. So that's always been a, a strong motivated. Now, the second one is a slight variation of employer mandated, but there are some employers who will fund your exams, uh, but they, but they're not necessarily saying you have to do exams, or they're not, not dictating which exams you actually take. So if you are in a situation where your employer says, go crazy, do exams, the, there's two different approaches that you tend to see there. There's the one where the company pays for it, and even if you fail, the company still pays for it. Um, that is, that's one that I really like because it means that you don't keep delaying taking the exam until you're absolutely ready because you don't want to be out of pocket for it. And the number of times I've seen people just keep delaying and delaying and delaying because they're saying, oh, there was this one thing I wasn't sure of, so I wanted to wait another 16 weeks <laughs> or 16 months to do the exam. And meanwhile, the, ex the exam is completely different to what you spoke to them about. Um, so. So with employer funded, what we normally find though, is that normally it's you get paid, you get reimbursed for exams that you pass, as opposed to uh, you know, getting reimbursed for any exam that you decide to take, regardless of outcome. Like, and look, either way, if your employer is, is paying for it, um, yeah, make, make, them, you know, make the most of it. Exams, exams aren't cheap. Um, yeah. Now, other things to think of there, sorry, yeah. What I was going to also say there is um, look online to see if there is the um, pass guarantee vouchers and things like that where you can go and say, oh, if you fail, go and reset the exam for 50% off or things like that, um, which yeah, tend to come yeah. up from time to time. Um, so there's less of a stress or concern about passing. Yeah. And that, and yeah, and basically there you pay a bit extra for that exam voucher, but it's it's got an insurance policy built in. Like the insurance policy isn't guaranteeing that you'll pass, but it means that if you don't pass, you can, you've got a, what do they call them? I think second shot. Yeah, yeah second so, chance. So, so that, yeah, so, so that way you get, uh, you do get that. And yeah. like they do cost a little bit more, but if someone is saying, look, I just tend to fail exams a lot. It's like, okay, well, rather than paying full price each time, this might be a smarter way of doing it. 
And, and now, also, if your work's yeah. paying for it, then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That way, you only have to tell them after you failed the second one, <laughs> which hopefully, hopefully isn't happening. Um, now, the... So other things then is in terms of some courses. So some people who are doing, you know, do, you know, different studies that aren't, you know, basically they're not part of the Microsoft world, but Microsoft certification, it might be part of a, a course they're doing. So it could be university related, TAFE related, things along those lines. Um, so that one, yeah, that one's fairly straightforward. Um, now, the next one's self-motivated. Like, I guess the problem that you run into when it's self-motivated is pretty much what Liam called out in chat, which is exam addiction. Um, so I actually had to make a call last week. So I, so I had two beta exams booked in, uh, one for Saturday and one for Sunday. I think you can start to get an idea as to why I started to consider canceling them. Uh, but then I looked at the exam. It wasn't until I looked at the exam objectives on Friday to start thinking, oh, I probably should prepare for these, that I just went, no, 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 no. And I will, I've included those as bonus exam discussions. I think it's the very last slide for today. So I'm not gonna reveal what those ones are, but some of you might be able to guess, but some of the things that are included with it are throwing me back over two decades. And I do not want to go back to two decades because I was a lot younger, happier and healthier back then. Sorry, Steve, are you muted? I am. I was just going to give you grief and say, are we talking about small business server? No, no, no. That was actually over two decades ago. Well, no, SBS oh, was still around in 2003. Oh, yeah, it was still around, but that started like, but yeah, that was going back to like 97. So this is something where there's, I, I won't give the year because if they give the year, it gives, it gives it away. Okay. Let, let's, it, let's, was, it was, it was SBS 2003. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so look so so one of the things that i think has improved when it comes to the self-motivated side is now with the role-based exams it's a lot you there's not as much of a, an approach where you could sort of sit down and map out like what's the minimum number of exams i do i do in order to get the maximum number of certifications so that used to be something that you know that was important for me uh, it's like, oh, if I, instead of doing this, um, you know, this exam, if I do that exam instead, it means that I can count both, I can count that towards two different certifications versus one certification. So those of you who, who've been doing Microsoft certs for quite a while, you kind of remember how complex some of those paths were. And sometimes you'd kick yourself going, oh, hang on, I shouldn't have done that exam. I should have done this one because it would have saved me two other exams to get me a particular certification. But now with the role, uh, with the role focus, I think it's a lot cleaner. Um, there, you don't have to mess around as much. Um, so, so on the self-motivated side, I'd say that it's like if you are in a position where you can dedicate yourself to get through a lot of exams in a short time period, that is absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, but but things like you know work, life, family, you know they you know they are going to sort of Put, put a stop to some of those things unless you've got some very, very understanding employers and family members there. And now the final one that I've got listed in here is the um, is future job opportunities. So it's not necessarily saying that certification will give you a new career, but it's not going to hurt you get, you know, move into a, a new career. Now, one of my favorite things that I ever witnessed, and this is going back to around the when doing Windows 2000 boot camps was a really big thing. So people would do certification boot camps, they'd sort of pay tens of thousands of dollars and they'd almost be guaranteed to come out of it as an MCSE. And any of you who remember where, um, now this, I'm kind of dating myself here and maybe dating some other people on the call. Uh, but if any of you remember where, um, it was it? It was Dimension Data had their Dimension Data Learning had a testing center or training center and testing center directly above Winyard Station. And I was sitting in there one time waiting until I could go in and do the exam, just having a coffee. And I overheard a conversation from someone who was saying, So, so how much am I going to earn at the end of that? And they gave them an amount. And the and the guy's response, I think it was a fair response, you know, for him, but the long-term thoughts weren't there. And his response was, F that, I earn twice as much of that already as a plumber. 
because yeah, because basically people were being sold on the idea 20 years ago or 20 plus years ago, you know, going to IT and you'll walk out, you know, get certified and you get a 100K job. And it's like, no, <laughs> no, no. Having certifications on their own isn't enough. But if you've got some experience and people can see that you're motivated to get certified, that's to me, that's probably the more important part is uh, is seeing that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and obviously, you know, you just never really know what's going to happen down the road. So I think with the future job opportunities, it's kind of smart for everyone to not just be incredibly focused on that one thing that they either really like or are really good at. Um, because if that thing disappeared tomorrow, so does Microsoft ever make products disappear? Yes. So if one of the, can we use SBS as the example again, Steve? So yeah, so so basically there, if we, yeah. So, you know, someone who said, I'm just going to know, learn everything I can about SBS and nothing else, then that would be, yeah, that would be a perfect example of where it's like, okay, that's going to backfire you at backfire on you at some point. Um, Oh yeah, clock and yeah, and we also had Comtech up on good old Duty Street in Alexandria as well. Uh, yeah, so yeah, so it was near the corner of Duty and Ralph Street. If I was infantile, I would laugh when I say that, but I'm choosing to be an adult for, for once in in my life. Um, and there's the Duty Street Cafe. <laughs> I, sorry, I can't I can't hold it in that. I think that's an excellent name. I don't think I'd want to eat there though, <laughs> based on the name. Okay, so then I guess any anything else or variations as to why you get certified or why you you know you know things that you think I might have missed here, just different frames of mind, etc. I can't think of any. No, it, look, I think that's a fairly broad one. Like this, definitely they'd be sort of have to be something else, but uh, yeah, it couldn't really be, yeah, it wasn't really anything I could think of. Okay, so the first thing then is I shouldn't have actually started off with why get certified because that's actually a secondary question. The primary question should be, do you want to do exams or do you want to get certified? Because you can do a whole bunch of exams without getting a certification. Uh, or you could be what I call a trophy hunter and you try to do as many exams as possible that will get you a certification. And that's in that, you know, maximum certification was something I used to sort of chase years ago. Uh, and I could have had some great conversations with you about it. If you look at my MCP transcript, you will see some very odd choices of exams on there, but I can probably tell you why I did them and it was probably just a shortcut to getting certain, you know, certain other things. Uh, so, so what you need to think about here is that, you know, so first of all, do you, like, do you just want to sort of pick and choose the exams that you want? And if there happens to be a certification alongside it, fantastic. Um, or do you really want certifications? Now, one of the things that has changed over the last few years is that um, the just not just Microsoft, but this is something that I really saw Amazon, or sorry, not Amazon, it was AWS that I really started seeing drive a lot of changes through the industry here, where they started to have much more of a do an exam, pass the exam, get a certification. While Microsoft was still doing, we'll do this, do this exam, and then do this follow-up exam, and then you'll get the certification. Now, how much of a difference do you really think it is? So. This item here, is it a problem if a certification requires more than one exam? Is that something that you think of, like for you personally, is that is that a problem if you have to do two exams versus one to get a particular certification? Oh, I have no Steve, problem. You've, Steve, you've got the, the cat tail today. That's normally my trick. Yep, yep. She uh, decided to uh, grab the RAM that I had sitting on my desk. <laughs> Um, and, and turn it into hers. Um, but that's yeah. okay. She's going up and hiding in a sleeping spot now. Yeah. Um, okay. So this this more than one exam per certification, I completely underestimated that. I thought surely it's not a big deal. It was a huge deal. The number of people who would be doing AWS certs instead of Azure certs 
uh, you would not believe the number of people who did that because they only needed to do one exam on the AWS side to be able to go to a prospective employer and say, I am, you know, cloud administrator, cloud administrator certified or architecture certified. Whereas meanwhile, Microsoft was saying, you know, he need to take two. And the thing that confused me at first about that was, you know, even though exams, like to me, exams aren't that expensive. So it's like, well, I can't really see how that amount of money is really going to be the deciding factor. But then you have to think about, you know, these are people who might be trying to get into the workplace, not people who are already in the workplace. Or if, so basically it's, you're starting to think, oh, it's people who, you know, them committing to do an exam, um, you know, it could be the actual cost that's an issue for multiple exams. It's the time requirements for multiple, uh, multiple exams. It's the stress of doing multiple exams. So this is something that for me was never really an issue because if you go back to things like your, like I think the Windows 2000 MCSE was kind of the, you know, the probably like one of the more brutal things where you, you just had to do a bunch of different exams in order to actually get uh, to get that MCSE. So you had to Seven do like exams. That. Yeah, you had to do like the core exam, the AD exam, the networking exam, the security <laughs> exam. So there were all of these different exams that you had to get. And that's what I was used to. So for me, doing two exams to get a certification, it's like, fantastic. yeah, absolutely fantastic. I have, you know, like no complaints from me at all. So, so now with it being, two, now when you've got ones that are two exams, to me, it's like, it's like, it's nothing. But I've got to remember though that, when I was doing those seven exams, I had an employer who paid for them all, who gave me time to prepare for them. So it's, you know, so basically I was in the best situation to actually, to actually be able to get through them. So, so it's some of those things that I've got to be really careful of where you sort of think it's people in different situations. It could be financial issues, like them going, hang on, what's an exam? $240, unless it's like the fundamentals ones are cheaper, but I think the other exams are around 240 Australian dollars. At that point, you go, oh yeah, I'm not just going to sit there and randomly do them if I'm not, if I'm not going to get some kind of uh, discount on them. So don't underestimate that you know that one versus two exam. Like I made that mistake, and it was like there was one particular conversation I had with somebody where it it really opened my eyes to it, and it was uh, you know someone who like still had a good job and stuff like that. But basically it was, yeah, it's, they were going, look, financial pressure means you just can't, you know, if you can do one instead of two, it makes, makes a lot more sense. Um, so Steve, did you also have the, um, the, the good old um, Windows resource kits, the Windows server and Windows NT resource kits? Do you remember those? The, 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 the blue books? Yeah, the ones that were like, and they sort of had their own, basically it was like 10 kilos of books in, a, in their own like cover thing. Yes, yes, yes. My, my, my work paid for all of the courses, all of the exams. Um, yeah, yeah, I was very, very, very lucky um, for my 2003 MCSE. My work paid for it all. Yeah. Um, joys of being government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so a couple of other things that pop up is, um, so certifications expire. It used to be they expired after two years and then you'd have to go and resit the exam like the way you'd normally sit an exam. But they've changed it to, so that now your certifications uh, need to be renewed annually, but you just do an online open book exam. So, uh, and with the open book exam types of questions, what I've noticed with a few of the ones I've had to do already is that it's the stuff that tends to change since you know, probably you know, since that previous year or over a year. So, so any of the new things that get worked into the exam objectives are the things that you're you're fairly likely to see in that uh, in that free uh, free exam. Now, in terms of exams, exams don't expire. So, any exam that you've done will always be on your transcript. I've got yeah, I've got exams going back to 1993. It doesn't show them as expired. I've got a ton of certifications that have expired, but uh, but the exams themselves don't expire because you have always passed that exam at that particular point in time. Now, in terms of that annual renewal of the exam, I've seen some people, you know, complaining about the um, about that requirement for it being annual instead of every two years. But what I will probably dismiss that kind of feedback as is 
grumpy old men not liking that the world has changed because it's been grumpy old men that I've seen complaining about it. So grumpier and older than me. So, you know, so basically, you know, uh, dinosaurs. Um, so, and I think this is something that I'm sure if you went back and said, okay, well, what certifications, you know, are the important ones to you? They'd probably say SQL Server, Windows Server, Exchange Server. You know, they're not going to be talking about any of the cloud services here. But if you think about how rapidly cloud services change, yeah, being like getting like a basically like a like not overly difficult quiz, multiple choice quiz on things that have you know, things that have been updated. Like doing that once per year, not really an issue. And I've got I've got two that I need to get another two that I need to get done over the next few months. And it's just you know the motivation to sit down and go, okay, I'm ready. I'll I'll do it now. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so yeah. So uh, yeah. So Brendan, yeah, with those yeah renewal exams. Uh, yeah, so some of them, uh, there was, so the one that I actually found more difficult than the others, because it's it's one that I hadn't really looked at some of that stuff for a while, was the Azure Administrator one. For some reason, that was one that I found a lot more difficult than some of the others. But I think it was just because it was jumping into a bunch of DNS and networking stuff that I just hadn't looked at in quite a while. So I just really wasn't, you know, wasn't ready um, for it. But a lot of the other ones, like they're things that it's like, oh, is that it? You know, and there's also wide variability in them as well. You might find that some you get, you know, 20 questions, others you might get 30 or 40 questions. Some of them you're just sort of reading the, the question and you already know the answer before you even look at the answers. So so they're, they're fairly, you know, fairly wide um, and you can sort of attempt them repeated times, but you know, if you fail it, you know, you can't just sort of try it again immediately. There's a timer before you can attempt it. So I sort of think that you need to sort of wait at least a day after the first fail and then a little bit longer after that or something along those lines. But they, yeah, they just haven't been, um, yeah, they just haven't been that difficult to uh, to get through. Oh, so, okay, so Andrew, yeah, so for the, the renewals, they are from, so basically if you take it, so let's say you get the, 90 days notice and you do do it 90 days out it doesn't start at that it doesn't start when you do the renewal it basically extends it for another year from when it would have expired so yeah so there's so basically you don't need to, to delay it until the last minute and hope for the best do it as early as you can and then it will basically you still get a full year on top of that yeah so i think even let me just sort of jump into my mailbox what have i got um, so I've got my Azure Admin Associates coming up again in May, and I've got, um, I think I've got, yeah, Teams coming up end of April. So, yeah, so, so those are ones that the, yeah, the Teams one, I don't think I'd have to do too much prep for that one, but I know the the Azure one. I'll need to sort of have a closer look at it and go, okay, what's changed? What are the things I'll probably get hit with? But because you can jump out to to Microsoft Docs, etc., and search, uh, it's generally not not terribly challenging. And so the good news there that means that once you've got a particular certification, as long as that certification stays alive from Microsoft, you only pay to do that certification once, and then you get those free annual renewals. I don't know about you, but I think for you know for most people, doing a free annual renewal where you can attempt it multiple times until the deadline, versus having to pay to sit it every two years, I I think I'm I'm kind of happy just being able to sort of fire up my laptop and go. I've got 20 minutes free. Let's see if I can get through it. So when it comes to just some of the core skills you should be thinking about when it does come to exams, Azure AD knowledge is your best friend in the world. You will be shocked and shocked, surprised, amused by how much you can get, like what percentage of exams you can get through just with Azure AD knowledge. And this applies to like Microsoft 365 exams, as well as a lot of the Azure exams. Um, and so, so this is something that it's, you know, even if it's not specifically an identity question, understanding elements of identity, such as, you know, they're sort of presenting a scenario to you where 
It may not be a conditional access question, but there are conditional access policies in there as part of it. Or it might be something where they're, you know, basically they're laying out group structures and it's not on groups though, it's on how those groups apply to the thing they're asking you about. So just think of Azure AD as that, as a core skill that you should have as you're moving into it. Now I've got call networking in here, um, just because whether you're looking at things like the, the Windows exams, some of the Microsoft 365 exams, or especially the, the Azure exams, the number of times you're gonna have some fairly basic subnetting type requirements in there. And, uh, and I'll give you a, an example of something that is a really bad sign <laughs> once we get up to a, a particular exam. There's a question that I've received on more than one, in more than one, one, in more than one training course there's a question that I've been asked repeatedly that makes me go, oh, this is not going to end well for you. Um, and and it's, it's something that, yeah, it's like just not part of what that person's world is, which means that anything TCP IP or just networking in general is going to be a struggle. Now, um, but as you move into some of the other Azure exams, then obviously the net, like if you're doing anything that does have a significant portion based on different, uh, networking appliances uh, that you deploy in Azure, et cetera, obviously there's gonna be a much stronger core networking, but even with things like your Windows exams, et cetera, or sorry, your, your modern desktop exams, I, there are questions where you might get something like just the, um, you know, a screenshot of the output of IP config, and it's showing the IP address as a 169 dot something. And, you know, so I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you're going, oh, 169, it means it's not getting, it hasn't been issued an IP address, so it's getting its own IP address from itself. So just little things like that, or where there'll be such a terrible mismatch in subnet configurations that the answers are just jumping out at you, even if you don't know much about subnetting. But if you don't know anything about subnetting, there are just these really easy parts of a scenario that are going to really trip you up in, uh, in other areas then. Now on the PowerShell side, I thought we'd be at a point in time where I would have to, I would have had to have had PowerShell at the top of this list in terms of this is the thing that you must know. But in reality, um, you know, most of the exams just don't have all that much PowerShell in them. Like I'd say like a worst case scenario with an exam that's got, let's say 50 questions, you might get five questions with, you know, with something that's PowerShell related. And even there, some of it might be just pick the, you know, pick the correct commandlet to run. And yeah, and the choices between get dash noun one, get dash noun two, set dash noun one, set dash noun two. They're, yeah, they're the, yeah, basically you know, questions like that or things where you know, it's you know, things that I call follow the variable questions where it's like, oh, there's something that's, there's a drop down item that I need to choose. I can see that a variable was declared at the beginning, but I can't see that variable has been called anywhere. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm looking for. So they don't expect you to be typing in PowerShell command, you know, commands from scratch. It's picking from what's there and you can, and just even a little bit of PowerShell knowledge, you should be able to at least get pretty close in, uh, in, a, in quite a few cases there. Um, now there are some, so there are some exams though where if you want to use PowerShell uh, to answer questions, you can, but we'll, we'll talk about some of that stuff uh, in just a moment. Now, when it comes to exam resources, there's no shortage of places you can go for exam resources, but I've tried to sort of break some of these things down into a couple of different categories. And I just realized when I was editing these slides that I absolutely messed up because um, slide one and slide two are the same. And let me tell you what should have been in slide one uh, before we move, but well, this is actually slide two. So I know what was on, was on this one. So in terms of the resources that are available to you, you've got places like Microsoft Learn, you've got, um, you know, you've got Udemy, uh, Pluralsight, et cetera. So there's no shortage of places you can go, but the things that I always, oh, sorry, you've got, uh, yeah, you've got, books that you can purchase through MS Press or other vendors. But the warning that I've always got to give around, you know, some of those sources. So as soon as it's something that like that's already been pushed out to a PDF uh, or if it's video that's already been recorded, you have to check to see how current it is because it may not be current at all. And the perfect example of this was yesterday, I sort of had to look up, uh, yeah, someone said, oh, what about the MS 900 uh, 
exam book from Microsoft. And I looked it up and I saw the date was 2020. And I said, I don't really think that's going to be of any use to you at all. Uh, now, that's not strictly true. There'd still be some stuff in there that might be OK. But I would be second guessing so much of what was in there uh, because you know, so, much, uh, so much is going to be changed. Now, other things to watch out for then with things like video content. So, you know, this is one of the downsides with that as well is, is that, you know, someone will go through, spend a lot of time and effort recording all the modules, but unless they are then putting out yeah, updates to those, so unless they've sort of really broken it out so that it's incredibly granular and they can easily replace like a five minute section rather than having to record like a two hour section, uh, a lot of those things get stale really, really quickly. And the problem that I have with anything like that is as soon as I see something where it's like, oh, that's not the current version of the exam objectives that you've got listed there, I will just tune out at that point in time and say, even if it's good content, my brain has already told me it's not current, therefore it can't be good content, which I know is not true. But it's, yeah, but it's just one of those things for me, it's like, oh, or alternatively, if I look at some of that content and go, Oh, this looks like heavily repurposed content. And the way that I can tell is that those logos you're using have not been used in the last decade. Um, or why are the icons of people looking like they were pulled from a Windows Server 2003 deck when everyone looked like they were an MSN messenger person? So, so for me, they're little things that I can't think of those as things that trigger me. I see that and it's like, oh, I can't trust this source. It doesn't matter how good the content is. It doesn't matter how good the person is presenting it. For me, it's like, sorry, you've lost me. Uh, you know, it's 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 game over. Um, now, what about Microsoft Learn? Now, Microsoft Learn is turn basically turning into what the Microsoft official curriculum is mostly being based on. Now, there's a huge exception that I'll show you in. In just a moment, uh, but a lot of the the Microsoft, uh, the like the official Microsoft curriculum that you would get as courseware if you went to like like an in person or online training course from a Microsoft learning partner, you will find that a lot of that stuff is just the same content, or well, not yeah you know, exactly the same content, or at least a point in time exact same version of what was on Microsoft Learn. So the question then comes up, is Microsoft Learn enough for you to be able to pass an exam? And like many questions, the answer to that is it depends. And I'll talk a bit more about some of the depends pieces a bit later on. But the problem with Microsoft Learn is that unless it's content that you're going through that's forcing you to get hands on and get exposure to the technologies, rather than just sort of quickly skimming through it and going, oh, I know that, I'll skip to the next page. Um, so, so Microsoft Learn does a good job of like sort of getting you from beginner to intermediate. Uh, but when you're like, but when it comes to exam prep, I think you're still you'll still need to go further into Microsoft Docs and start, you know, really looking at, you know, trying to identify, you know, more technical content on things that address your uh, your weaknesses there. Now the so then the other th good thing about Microsoft Docs, oh, sorry, the Microsoft Learn content. Is that it? Um, is that it does? Uh, you know, it does get updated on a regular basis. People like giving Microsoft bad feedback if content is out of date, uh, and GitHub makes it really easy for people to give Microsoft feedback about things that it's like, oh, you capitalized in the no, not capitalizing in the wrong place, but it's like, why does this still say Windows Defender ATP? <laughs> after all these years. So little things like that, you still find some of that stuff, but um, on, you know, sometimes they'll kind of ignore those comments because it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't negatively affect the content overall. But for someone like me, I'd see that WDATP uh, reference and I'd be like, oh, this hasn't been updated in three years now. Um, now in terms of, um, you know, like, so what I tend to do here is, I, and some of you probably use them, uh, the, I put together the exam resource guides over on in tuned in. And this is, this is just sort of something that, you know, the, the things that I've got listed in there are basically courses that I train often enough that it's worthwhile me putting these together. So that if someone says, what do I do next in terms of preparation? Basically that's the goal and Liam, Liam can confirm that. So Liam's been on a few of my training courses over the years where I would have definitely been uh, promoting this and saying, hey, here's one that I put together uh, based on the current uh, exam descriptions for you. 
And for me, it just means I get to sort of see what changes occur in the exams. And it gives me an opportunity to try to identify trends, see if I can make predictions, see if they fix things that are long overdue for fixing. We can maybe look at, look at some of those again today. Uh, but, but that way, it just sort of keeps me aware of what's happening. And it's also like good from a historical perspective for me to be able to go back to some older articles and go, oh, I didn't realize the exam had changed that much uh, during that time frame. Now, other things you should be looking at, um, and uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to position how I'm supposed to be positioning this because it's up on it's up on my it's up on GitHub, so it's there for everyone to see. But we kind of get varying advice around: Are we supposed to promote it or not promote it? So I'll take my MCT hat off and I'll put my MVP hat on and say, yeah, you know, as IT pros, you should be leveraging whatever's available to you on GitHub. There we go. Yeah, that's so. I think I think I framed that one correctly. Now, for a lot of the, the lab, lab instructions that you'll find up on GitHub for, the, for some of the training we'll talk about, a lot of it is stuff where you don't necessarily have to have any kind of specialized VMs to go through and run through the content. But there are going to be other examples, though, where things like modern desktop, uh, so MD100 and MD101, they've basically got like full-blown lab environments with MDT, WDS, Convig Manager, et cetera, et cetera, all ready to go. So you can jump in and and basically follow the bouncing ball to go through instructions. But obviously GitHub is not hosting those VMs. It's the hosting lab providers that do that. So in some of those cases, like, like in this case, I've just sort of called out this, the Windows 10 and 11 Office uh, and Office deployment lab kits. So it's not exactly the same as what you've got in the MD100 and 101 lab environment, but it's close enough that if you are preparing for the, you know, if you're someone who thinks you're ready to start preparing for the exam, you should be able to do translation of, oh, it's not DC1, it's DC01, or it's not this username, it's another username. So there's gonna, so you, you'd need to sort of map things out, but this this will sort of save you a lot of pain. But if you use other things based on the, the hydration tools, this is just like, this is just someone has gone through and said, like, let's just sort of build out this hydration environment. It will go through, populate it. It's 30 gig in size. Um, and this is something that I've been using for years. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's fantastic. The only downside of it is that it's eval software. Uh, but then when you sort of do get the new versions every, you know, 90 days or whatever, um, it just sort of means that they get an opportunity to update the documentation, put some new scenarios in there for you to take a look at as well. So definitely, uh, definitely recommend it. Okay, so, so I'm just sort of checking some of the comments in in chat. Yeah, so with the yeah, so with learn, it's so learn, it's yeah, like so I can't make a sweeping statement about the quality of the exam prep material on learn because it does vary wildly from one exam to another exam. Now in some exams, they they actually do go back, go out and basically map it directly to at least a version of what the exam objectives were. So in those cases, then basically it's really curated. They're making sure they've pulled in content that does map with what's there. But then there are other cases. And let me let me show you this one. Let, I think I might even have it loaded up and ready to go. So look, so lab kit Win 11 lab V2. So that's just finished downloading. So uh, so that's there. So the MD100 client, so legacy Windows exam. Let's take a look at the loan content for this one. Then, then I'm doing the slow reveal. Oh, Microsoft 365, modernize enterprise deployment with Windows devices and Microsoft 365 apps. That's it. Now, while this is not completely irrelevant to the exam, the vast majority of what this exam is going to test you on was put into Windows prior to Microsoft 365 being a thing, prior to Office 365, before BPOS was a thing. So a lot of the like the like the really core cool Windows features that this exam is going to test you on, this learning path does absolutely nothing. So when I did the so when I was sort of putting together the study guide for this one, 
this was a really tough one to do because the vast majority of the content that I had to go through and find was basically archived content over in docs. So, so basically, if you search, you know, using a search engine, a lot of that content's not going to show up because it's functionality that hasn't really changed since, in some cases, let's say Windows NT Server 3.1. <laughs> so there's some, yeah. So this one, like, if you can give a score of an F minus for the content mapping to the exam objectives, that would be a generous score for this one. Um, and this is, and and I'm calling this one out especially because it's it's really the worst of the ones that I've ever seen. Like other ones generally do a pretty good job, but this one is not someone who does this and then goes and does the exam. Um, unless there's someone who's been using Windows for years and has been paying attention to what the top 10 things that Microsoft claimed or top 10 new features from Microsoft's perspective at that point in time, a lot of that stuff is in this exam. And a lot of that is not stuff that any of you touch on a daily basis, even if you work with Windows on a daily basis. Oh, oh storage spaces. Yeah, sure. F fantastic. Um, file restore. Excellent. Um, okay, so. Performance okay, so monitoring. Because <clears throat> everybody very, goes very, and uses very, performance very, monitoring. Very little of that. Yeah, that's kind of so. So that sort of co was covered more in the server exams, but they've now been discontinued. Yep. <laughs> but dot dot dot. We'll come back to those. Okay. So okay. So I've I've covered everything that what should have been on this slide, but I basically <laughs> deleted the wrong slide. So I'll go through and update that uh, so that I've got a copy that actually makes sense. So moving on to the exam prep side. So one of the recommendations that I always make is grab that PDF. Uh, and by that PDF, I mean, so let's use this as, as the example, seeing that I'm here. Grab the exam skills outline. Um, so don't make the mistake uh, as if you're new to Microsoft exams. Don't get to this part, click schedule the exam, and then never come back to this page. Um, that is going to be a huge mistake for you. What you need to do is come down to skills measured and go, Oh yeah, I know this, I know this, and I know that. Don't do that. Instead, grab the exam skills outline, save it, open it in Word so that you can edit it, and then start color coding everything based on how badly you suck in different areas. So green means I don't suck at this, I, I know what it is. Orange is I, I think I might suck, but I'm not sure. And then red is I know for sure that I that I suck at this one. So, or so even alternatively, if, yeah. what you can do is if you've got the second chance voucher, is go and sit it, see what yes. you're going to succeed in, and then yeah. Come go back. and sit the second exam yeah. and go, oh, I just need to focus on the parts that were really bad. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, so if you take so if you take a look at what's in here, so this so so going through and you know, basically approaching it and going, okay, what do I know, what do I don't know? Other things that you should be doing if you do take this approach is wherever you see and or a comma, just break that out into its own bullet point. Because what I've seen time and time again is people reading that first bit and going, oh, my eyes hurt. I don't want to read the rest of that. And they don't realize that there are actually four or five other things that they are going to ask about. And the way that I know that people don't read the longer ones is even when people do look at these lists, I'll come out of the exams and go, oh, there was a bunch of stuff that wasn't in the exam description. It asked about servicing stack updates, driver updates, Microsoft product updates. And it's like, oh, you're just not very good at reading. Um, or alternatively, people will list just a huge bunch of things that are listed here. And what you'll find is that they just didn't know that that PDF exists for each of the different exams. So that's kind of just you know something that you should be using to then start going through and you know start planning your preparation. So once you've identified the weaknesses, you know, focus on those, but don't ignore the things that you think you know, because if you haven't looked at those things in a while, they may have changed. There are still going to be features that you've never used. Um, and so even with things like, let's, let's use Windows printing as an example. Okay. How much has Windows printing changed over the last 10 years or 20 years? Uh, it's changed a lot in the last 18 months with print nightmare. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay, so prior to that. <laughs> prior to so that, things, no, it didn't. 
Um, it was consistent. It was the same. But yes, in the last yes. six to twelve months, uh, yeah. how you do printing and how you manage it has um, <laughs> changed. It's been yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. See, but for exam prep, how many people would say, "Oh, yeah, I know Windows printing," and then they wouldn't look at anything Windows printing based for their prep. Then they'd go to the exam and they'd go, oh, I don't know what the difference is between a printer and a print device. Which one is the actual physical hardware? So make sure that you are sort of just, you know, you're not completely ignoring the things that you think you know, because you might know some parts, but, but there are going to be other things that you don't know. Now, also, because you, you see the different weightings that different parts of the exam have, that should also help to guide you. Uh, in terms of how much time should you really be spending on a particular set of items under a particular category. Now, I'd also say as you get closer to the exam, go through and you know, just do a fresh version of that, uh, of that um, self, self grading against those different items to see if there's anything that, you know, that's changed color, things that basically you thought were green, but you're reading on other things has made you realize that maybe they're actually an orange or a red. And now this final bit, take calculated risks. This is something that people, some, some people don't like me talking about this one, but it's something that is a smart strategy when you are time constrained or maybe when you're just lazy or if you're just at the point where you can't study any longer. So what do I mean by the calculated risk? Let's go back. Okay, this exam is a bad example. Let me just see if 101 is a good example. Nope, that's a bad, actually, no, this is a better example, I think. Let me just see. Okay, this one's a better example. So why am I saying this one is a better example? In this case, you can see that manage apps and data is only worth 10 to 15% of the exam. So if you're at the point where you are pretty confident and not, not you know, not because you are, sorely mistaken or overestimating yourself. But if, 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 if these first three items are things that you know that you are rock solid on, it's stuff you've been doing for years, you have dreams about it and you wake up happy having dreams about these things. The calculated risk here is saying, well, this is only going to be 10 to 15% of the exam. If I do pretty well to incredibly well in each of these three areas, I do not need to know a thing about this category. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing where like we're here. So I wouldn't necessarily say do it with an entire category, but if we then sort of drill into that manage apps and data and I start seeing a few things in there that I've just never seen before, but then I realize that there's a bunch of things in here that I have seen. So if we take a look in here and it's like, I kind of know half of that, but I don't know the other half and I know half of this, but not the other half. I'd be looking at it in terms of my time going how desperately do I want that to be 15% versus 7.5%? And if I'm pretty confident that I'm, you know, based on my prep, based on my, you know, the prep, you know, what I've already put into the exam, if I'm pretty confident that I should pass, even if I bomb out completely in that area, I would do the exam um, because I don't, because there's probably a good reason why I haven't looked at this stuff and why I don't know about it. It's because it is stuff that either I absolutely don't care about or even worse, I am incredibly, incredibly dispassionate about it. Uh, so things, yeah, so the things that you don't learn about because you think it's dull and boring and have no interest in it whatsoever. So, so that's what I mean there by using that calculated, uh, calculated risk. Now, this is something where for it's probably better if you are someone who's done quite a, if you've done a few Microsoft exams to take that approach um, rather than sort of taking that approach at the beginning. Uh, and then what you'll, and what you'll find though, is that if you know the other areas quite well, uh, in a lot of exams, you're probably not going to see that much of a difference in the score of the areas where you do, where you know the stuff versus the areas where you don't know, because you've probably done enough prep to sort of make the scores pretty decent for everything. So what about multiple exam prep? So probably the, the big things here, pick or do the exam that's the low hanging fruit, first of all. So even if it means going in and doing a fundamentals exam, just to get a feel for like it. And if you haven't done Microsoft exams before, so get a confidence boost, um, 
you know, go through and go, oh, that, that, that was easy. Like I'm motivated to get more exams done. But also um, with this one, you know, doing something like a fundamental exam with online prop. So if you've got a, if you're going to be doing online propted exams for the first time and you've got, you know, normal exams and fundamentals exams to do, I would say do the fundamentals exams first so that any kind of first time stress doing exams in that environment is something that shouldn't really impact your, your fundamentals exam responses, uh, as opposed to it being something that could cause chaos for you in a two to three hour exam versus, you know, realistically, to give you some ideas of timing, like the last time I did MS 900, I did it within a 15 minute coffee break and SC 900, uh, but that was only like 35, so 35 questions, I think in 12 minutes. SC 900 was 55 questions and that took 13 minutes. So that's kind of my maximum number of questions per minute that I've been able to answer in an exam. Um, whereas, you know, and that, and basically there it's, you know, like obviously I don't, I don't verify my answers. I don't double check anything. For me, exams are just speed runs. It's like the sooner I get out of the exam environment, the sooner I can eat a hamburger or, or I should say something healthy. Um, now, other things as well is, is if you are doing multiple exams and they're exams that do have overlapping technologies with them, don't put them back to back. So don't like, maybe you don't have a choice. Maybe you have to do them on the same day, for example. But I would normally say leave a day between them just so that if there's anything that you see that you know is going to be part of multiple exams, that you've got time to go back and go, oh, I hadn't heard that term. I didn't understand that part of the UI. Um, so give yourself some prep time. And probably the best example of where I was able to really leverage that was when the AZ100 and AZ300 series of exams first became available. Um, uh, basically, I was able to sort of, I booked it in so that I think it, like I did them like the 100s were done on a Monday, the 101s were done on a Wednesday, and the 102s were done on the Friday. So, and 102 and 302 were the only two of the exams I actually needed to take. Uh, but because I had free vouchers because they were beta exams, I was basically doing the two standalone exams for each as a warm up before going in and doing the exam I actually needed to pass. And trust me, there was stuff I saw in the two lead up exams that was stuff that I'd never looked at, but I had to make sure that I looked at by the time I got to uh, got to Friday. Uh, so, yeah, so so basically don't try to squeeze things in too closely uh, because the chances are you'll get asked questions in a way that doesn't quite sit with how you learnt the technology and you're going to go have to go, going to go and have to do a bit of additional uh, technology. Um, Okay, so what have okay, so I'm just sort of seeing comments. It looks like most things have been answered in there. Um, now, just in terms of the proctored, you know, doing an online proctored exam versus going into a testing center. So my opinion, and obviously a lot of what we're covering tonight is 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 my opinion, but my opinion is that going to a testing center is a lower stress scenario uh, because you walk in, everything's already set up. Uh, and you basically get in there, you do the exam, and that's it. You do not need to be concerned about anything that goes on around you in that testing center. Uh, so, so here where I've got like, so things like networking PC, I'll talk about what happens when they don't meet the requirements. But this other, this one here, individual quirks don't interrupt the exam process. So how many of you have done an online proctored exam? And if you have, do you, um, have you had the voice of God drop in and say, oh, hello, what are you, what, Mr. Mark, what are you doing? Maybe, maybe they don't call you Mr. Mark, but, um, but it's like little things. So if I'm, so if you're sitting there, for example, like that, because that's just, or, you know, you know, basically let's pretend my elbows are on the desk. You're sitting there like that, you're thinking, or yeah, so don't cover your mouth. Um, now, Liam's typed in something really important here. Don't mouth words. You would be shocked at how many people mouth words when they read and they do not know it. It's when they start doing these proctored exams that they're being repeatedly being told 
stop moving your stop moving your mouth. Like everyone thinks, surely when I'm reading something, my lips aren't moving. And it's like, I think there's a probably a higher percentage of the population that does that then then realizes. Um, but it's like, what are you, you know, what are you looking at, et cetera. So, so there are some, yeah, so there are some downsides to the online exams, but, um, you know, but the, uh, but let me just sort of finish off with the, the testing center things uh, first. So, so if you've got any quirks, et cetera, uh, like if you've got the habit of, you know, looking down, looking up, looking left, right, closing your eyes, mouthing words or singing songs, you know, maybe someone at the testing center is going to go, are you, yeah, are you, are you okay? Are you having a stroke? But they're not, yeah, but it, it's not something that will get you booted off the exam without you being able to explain yourself. Now, some downsides of testing centers is some testing centers have got absolute garbage PCs that they appear to have bought at cash converters for $5. Um, things that you're like, when on earth did computers and mice and keyboards and screens like this exist? I don't remember it. Now, I think we're probably almost at a point where they've maybe gotten rid of their CRTs in some of them. Uh, so, so I'd sort of, so for me, it's it's that's one of those risks. Like I like having control of my screen resolution and my screen size. So for me, going to a testing center that's that's a downside unless it's a testing center that I know has got you know decent lab set up. Now the other good thing about the testing centers, and this is something that sounds like a weird comment until it until you encounter it in an exam, which is you don't get you can't write anything down on paper in a proctored exam. So any of you who've done uh, in-person exams where you've got a sheet of paper or that good old laminated cardboard with the erasable marker, you know, the, you know, under, uh, I've said it's underappreciated. You don't realize how awesome it is until you're sitting in a proctored exam where you get an on-screen whiteboard where you can draw things with your mouse. <laughs> because I'm sure that if you tried to draw with your surface pen, They'd be like, "What are you? What are you doing? Why have you got a? Why have you got a pen in the room? You can't have a pen in the room." Um, so, so that is something that is is absolutely fantastic to have access to, um, you know, in there. Now, online proctored is a really good exam. It's convenient. Um, uh, so, yeah, incredibly, yeah, incredibly convenient. The, um, uh, but you have to have an environment that suits it. So. Yeah, so you can't sort of be in a in a room that resembles a fish tank where there's no way that you can't be looking at other people. Uh, you can't have other people come in and talk to you. You can't have dogs jump on you during it. Uh, don't have cats sitting outside the door meowing at you for two hours while you're doing an exam. Uh, but and both of those are based on true on true stories. Um, now, other things as well is that with your PCs, so. Um, the more crap you have on your PC, and I don't mean necessarily bad stuff like crap, I just mean stuff um, that you have on your PC, the more likely it is to be problematic in terms of something causing a pop-up that tries to uh, become the foreground screen, which automatically will kick you out of the exam because as soon as the exam sees that, it says, sorry, you've got something that could be some kind of cheat mechanism in place. Uh, so so while there's so, some so of those- So what you're saying there, Mark, is run it on a virtual machine. No, you can't do that either because you need to have camera. Uh, depends on. if you're doing VMware, yeah. you can route your camera inside you. Yeah, they. I'm pretty sure they'd still be doing checks for that. They actually, yeah, I think they specifically tell you it can't be virtualized. <laughs> um, so, so as long as you've got control over it, um, and you know, PCs that are terrible PCs to do this on are. Uh, work devices that are locked down like crazy. Um, because in that case, you know, you may not even be able to run the, the special browser down download you have to do, uh, run in order to actually make this work. So test all of that stuff in advance to make sure that you know that it that it works. But online proctoring, you know, a lot of benefits, incredibly convenient. Basically, you walk into a room in the office or a room in your house, you know, and then 30 minutes to an hour and a half or two hours later, you walk out and go, you know, two thumbs up or two thumbs down. Yeah, so yeah, and just looking at Liam's comment here, the, yeah, so yeah, so Brendan, so for me, so I have to do these in the bedroom. And so basically I turn a set of drawers into a desk and uh, I use the bed as a chair. <laughs> 
when I'm doing when I'm doing exams because that's really the only space I've got that meets the requirements of you know not having multiple screens and you know and things that they'd be looking at and you know windows that, where people would be thinking I could get secret answers from etc. Um, now yeah so and Liam's comment around you know sometimes you just get you know proctors who just constantly interrupt like every time you scratch your nose or pick your nose or whatever uh, they're like what are you doing do you have answers hidden in your nostrils uh, and there are others who are just you know just pretty you know pretty chilled about it um, so that yes yeah, so they can really change the um, uh, the thing so it's yeah so just make sure so for me like I make sure that I've got things like OneDrive shut down um, you know just so yeah you know, just so that you know I don't yeah you know, or I just sort of go through and see like a, what is it like anything that's sort of you know potentially going to do a background update or whatever I'll make sure that stuff is shut down um, I've, I haven't had an issue, but I've seen things where, uh, when we've been doing in-room proctoring, where people's AV has popped up partway through an exam, saying something, something, something on the network has been detected. And guess what? You're kicked out of the exam. And then they come to you and say, oh, can you get me back in? It's like, I can't. You've got to call that support number that's on screen and see if they can get you back in there. <laughs> so you've got to, so Defender on the desktop being very quiet is a good thing. Just make sure it doesn't run a scan and give you a notification partway through. Uh, yeah, so little things like that. Now, I'm painting the worst possible picture of things that can go wrong. In reality, very few people actually have, have any of those kinds of issues. Okay, so what about during the exam? So, so here, the passing score is 700 out of 1,000, which does not mean 70%. Um, so there may be questions in the exam that are not marked. It could be new questions they're getting ready to roll into the exam, uh, that they're basically doing, maybe doing some A-B comparison testing on them. So, you know, you don't get marked on those. Uh, there might be some questions that are worth more points than others. There might be accelerators applied. So. Um, so I think Liam, Liam, did you do 70-347? Uh, yes, I did that the round before everyone started passing. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. And so Liam knows exactly what I'm talking about here. So 70-347 was an exam that if we had a room of 20 to 30 people doing an in-person proctored exam, we'd be lucky to have a third of them pass. And those that passed would be scraping by with barely over 700 scores. And then there was this something, there must have been some kind of cosmic event where people got really, really, really smart for a short amount of time. And all of a sudden, uh, large numbers of people were getting 900 plus scores exam uh, scores in that exam. Uh, the questions didn't change. People did not magically get smarter. Um, instead, my theory is they ran out of fails that they could issue for that exam. So they had to start giving people passes. And it's like, okay, well, what scores don't we give out? And it's like, oh, we've never given out 900 pluses on this one. No, so basically I think it was just that they saw the results were so bad that they, yeah, it's like, oh, maybe it's not the people doing the exam. Maybe it's the exam that's the problem. So there was this brief period where people were getting ridiculously high scores. So a bunch of people I knew who had to get through that exam I was like contacting them going, do the exam, do the exam. And it happened to coincide, I think, with the last tech ed on the Gold Coast. And uh, and basically telling people, you know, do you know, do you need to do three, four, seven? Yes, do it now. Like what this week, this month? No, like today, now, go do it. And they'd come out of it going, holy crap. But the thing that was a the telltale sign though was even though their score may have been in the 900s. If you took a look at the breakdown of the different sections, they may have been barely getting close to around 50 to 60% in each section of the exam. So if anyone says, oh no, 700 out of 1,000 means 70%, it's like not when it comes to exams that have got uh, weightings applied to them. Now, in terms of questions, 45 to 55 questions uh, seems to be the norm. Now, there may also be labs in the exam. How can you predict if there will be? You cannot. Uh, somebody might take the same exam as you in the same location as you 
an hour before you and they do get the exam, you go in and you don't get the exam. Um, it's there, There's nothing we really see that predict that. But exams have started coming back in, sorry, the, um, the labs have started coming back into exams. Uh, so I think MD, so far I've gotten feedback from people recently, MD100 has had labs and AZ500 has had labs as well. But it's only been a small portion of people who've been uh, responding there. Now, the labs do not make the exam harder unless you don't know the stuff in the exam. Um, though even the things that they generally get, are asking you to do in the exam, there's, it's like, okay, so you're saying, make sure that this virtual machine is backed up or something like that. It's like, okay, well, I could, if I could just go look at backup, yes, it's backed up. So it's almost like, yeah, if you've worked, if you're comfortable with the environment, with the portals, et cetera, uh, labs just add time. So if you're someone who's used to doing, you know, normal Microsoft exams in under an hour and getting out of the room to get that much desired burger and maybe some uh, some chips and a Coke along with it, um, you're not going to be doing that. Uh, think that you're more than likely going to be in there for an hour and a half to two hours at minimum. And for me, that just drives me nuts because I'm bored. I was about to say a word I shouldn't use, but I was like, I'm just sort of bored. I'm over it. I want to get out of there. It's like, you know, I've got I've got 30 to 45 minutes of good thinking. Stretching it out like that uh, is not a good a good thing for me. So it just drags the exam out. It doesn't make it harder. It doesn't make it easier. Uh, but I'd say if you don't know the topic at all, and if you're someone who's just trying to bluff your way through uh, the exam, which I'm willing to admit I have done that uh, in the past, and I will do it in the future. Um, it's it does add complexity in those cases because the things they're asking you to do generally aren't that difficult unless you've got no idea what they're even asking. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so with the let's, labs. Let's be honest on that one though, Mark. That's exactly why they're testing you on it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's important now, to understand they are asking the questions for a reason and forcing you to answer how to do a lab for a reason. Yeah. And the exams I've had with lab-based scenarios in them, I don't have any complaints about the types of questions I was getting asked, but it was because they were things I knew and I could answer them. <laughs> and I could answer them quickly, but I had to wait for Azure or M365 to actually complete the tasks. And that's where the time element comes in. You're basically yep. twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the environment to light up, et cetera. And there's like a page that went live a couple of years ago. Uh, I'll see if I can find it and I'll post the link uh, later. But it's, uh, yeah, I think Liberty Munson wrote it just sort of talking about how it impacts the exams. But I'd say it, it doesn't make it easier or harder, but it also means so that if you're partway through the exam, and there's something that you saw earlier. It's like, oh, but that thing is bugging me. I can't figure out what it, if I got it right or wrong. Now, you won't be able to go back to those questions at this point in time, but you can still poke around in whatever portal you're in and look for things that you forgot to study or things that you're not sure about. Um, and maybe you might still get some, come with some questions after the labs that ask you about it. Now, other things to do is don't mess up the time allocation that you've got for your exams. So they tell you exactly the number of questions you get at the beginning of the exam. It says, this exam contains 55 questions. So with that 55 question example that I've got in here, if you start off with five case study questions, that means you've got 50 more questions to go. Now, what I've seen way too many times is people will do the five case study questions, then get into that next section but instead of it saying 50 questions, it has 45 questions. And people go, oh, I must have done really well in those five because they've basically dropped the number down. It's like, no, it is still 55. So there will be 45 kind of regular multiple choice type questions, but then there will be another section at the end of the exam, which will be case study questions. The number of people who get to a minute or two left because they want to maximize their time, then click next thinking they're finishing the exam and instead they get case studies pop up um, that you yeah, know that is something that I shouldn't laugh but it's like it gives you all the information at the beginning of the exam it gives you reminders as you're working through the exam so so with that make sure that you are answering every question before you proceed even if you don't know the answers you do not get marked down for any questions that you answer incorrectly and there are certain types of questions that you cannot go back to once you've clicked next 
even if you haven't answered the question, you cannot go back to them. Um, and and basically, they make it really, really clear that you cannot, you know, the next questions, you cannot go back to them because it's effectively the same scenario, but they'll present three different solutions and they're basically just yes or no type questions. And as you go from, from question one in the series to two to three to four or whatever number there is, you already figure out whether you got the first couple of answers correct. Um, and, and these ones are, you know, these are ones where I've time and time again, I've had people go, oh, I didn't realize. And it's like, it's got it in bold text at the top of the screen. It tells you in a section break prior to getting to those. But in exam conditions, your brains do not work the same way. So it's not that people are idiots. It's that their brain has brain has just chosen not to process something that, you know, they basically discarded something that was really, really important on screen. Now, a few of the frequently asked questions that I get, and I'll try to keep a straight face as I'm answering some of these. Okay, why isn't the exam more focused or just focused on the things I do each day? Uh, because the exam's not for you, it's for a lot of different people. Next question. Okay, why is this particular technology included in this exam? Because that's a question that I ask a lot as well. Sometimes I'll look at it going, really, this in that exam? And what you have to remember there is it's that's just a variation of that first question. It's like it's like well, just because that's not part of how you think about that tech, that exam and what's included, uh, you know, it could just be that in other scenarios that might be something that is still important. Now the next one, what if I don't like any of the answers? Um, more than likely, that just means you have created or you have added things to the scenario that are not in the scenario. So if it's a quick, so it might be something where they're talking about, let's use an example. And because I've, I had to sort of word a question to try to trick people about stuff and it was incredibly successful. And it was basically a question where the answer was autopilot. Um, but when you sort of ask people and I'll use, so I'll, and for some of you, if, so if, if I talk about doing autopilot for initial device setup, how many of you think purely of auto the autopilot? So basically autopilot says, I'm done. You're at the login screen. Goodbye, I'm, I'm going home. How many of you think of autopilot as stopping there? Or how many of you sort of think of autopilot as, you know, but and would also include the handoff to Azure AD and Intune as part of that? And the number of people who don't just go to that point and Steve and Kwok, I'll point at Microsoft employees here, and understandably so, you know, in their mind, as they're thinking through the scenario, they're thinking an end-to-end -end Microsoft solution. So guess what? Office slash Microsoft 365 apps are also getting deployed in their mind. So when they're seeing things like click to run in the answers, like we, we constantly see 20 to 30% of people choosing click to run. And it's like, oh no, we didn't even say any desktop, any apps were being deployed. We just said to, to simplify initial setup for end users. Uh, so don't put things into and or don't put things into scenarios that aren't there. And we all do it to a degree. We all have our versions of how we want things to be done. Um, so even if we don't necessarily like the answer that we know is going to work, um, yeah, we still have to choose the answer that is going to work because you can't type in your own answer like you could, or you can't even argue with the exam in a proctored exam because they'll kick you out of the exam for talking. <laughs> so don't don't do that. Um, so, so probably the position that I normally take on this um, is select the least wrong answer yeah. in your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to do it. Now, the next one, this is something that I hear all the time from people, and I do not agree with it. Um, yeah, I felt like they were manipulating the English language to try to trick me into answering incorrectly. No, um, if the in, if the language in an exam question is so ambiguous that you think it's a riddle. Um, that is not the intent. Uh, that is something that is going to make the question 
unworkable for anyone who's got English as a second language who doesn't understand the subtleties of English wordplay, for example. So it should be really clear uh, language. Now, what I find a lot of the time, not always like doing, you know, like I will, I am more than happy to comment on questions where I don't think it's well written, where the language isn't clear, or where yeah, I am more than happy to put in comments where I do not believe the people who wrote these questions understand what this technology actually is. So I had to put put that in, in an Azure exam where I don't believe that the people understood the difference, or it was basically, I don't think they understood that a hybrid AD joint device was not joined to AD. <laughs> The, so basically, it's not that the wording was trying to trick you. It was just that I don't think they actually knew what they were talking about uh, in there. Um, so, so in that case, it's like if you're doing beta exams, uh, you know, you might see some of that stuff. But in exams that have been out for a while, you really shouldn't see uh, too much of that that kind of stuff in there. Um, now, will you get? Oh, sorry. So, how current are exam questions? Work on the assumption that. They were probably last updated somewhere in the, you know, that like in terms of features going GA, et cetera, work on the assumption that somewhere between three to six months out of date. Uh, just because it takes a lot of time to go through uh, the editing, the approval process. And the reason for that is that it's not just that, it, you know, Microsoft's not the only person that these exact, that these certifications are used for or these exams are used for. Other organizations use these exams as part of their official curriculum for testing. So there's a lot of, um, basically a lot of tape, you know, not, not paperwork, but, you know, red tape that has to go through to get these updates pushed out. But exam questions are being constantly updated, even if the exam description itself isn't being updated. If they can update within the frame of what's already in the exam description, they'll do that without sort of putting out a new exam description every month. Um, now, just to yeah. double click on that one, Mark, the fastest I've seen exams from uh, go from questions being written to made public on a beta is six weeks. Yeah. So, and that's rare. It's typically yeah. a lot longer than that. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there. So, going into the beta six weeks, then beta would probably run for maybe four weeks. And then it would probably be another eight weeks before the exam actually went went live. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of lead time there. Now, the next question is actually a really good question and it's hard to answer. Will I get questions on preview features? If the exam description says you may get questions on preview features, then you may get questions on preview features. Now, this is something that I think they will generally avoid uh, because, yeah, so there might be some cases where it might be asked on. So a perfect example of something that you will get questions on in exams is your, uh, so Office, uh, so yeah, Defender for Office 365 safe attachments. Uh, the ability for you for it to basically send the email through before it sends the attachment through. Who knows how long that has been in preview for? <laughs> I'm guessing two years, Mark. I, I think it's like I think it's like three and a half or four years at least. Okay. Okay. So, and that is something that is definitely in these exams. So that's one example. And the wording is kind of bad because it'll say if they are commonly used. How on earth do I know what preview features are commonly used? Like I know which ones I use. I know which other ones people I know use, but I don't know in general. So I think it's so. There'll be some things that you will see that. So that one, I can't actually give you a yes or no. That one is definitely a maybe. Um, do you have to sit exams that replace ones that are retired? No. Remember, your exams are forever. It's certifications that need to be kept up to date. Now, the last one, I, I, I wish I had a dollar for every time I was asked, how much time do I need to put into preparation? Um, what I'll normally do when I get that is I'll give a number, but I won't actually give a unit of time. So I'll say seven and they'll go, oh, seven weeks. And it's like, oh, yes. that sounds good. <laughs> yes, if they go seven months. Yes. So basically what I find with that is the unit of time that people seven give is going to indicate how ready they are for the exam. So it's almost a self, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Somebody who's really not ready for the exam will go, yes. 
<laughs> but someone who's pretty confident will go hours or days. Um, minutes. And yeah, and this is yeah minutes. And look, and look, this is something that the reality is the more of the skills you walk in to your exam prep with, as opposed to things you're learning during your exam prep. So the more that you've got before you start preparing for that particular exam, the more likely it is that you are going to pass. Because that means that you probably understand the technologies, you understand their relationship with other things. Whereas somebody who's just going through and learn, try, basically trying to learn what they can for the exam, things fall apart really quickly when it tries to get part A and part B communicating with each other. And the person goes, well, I've only looked at part A in isolation and part B in isolation. I didn't even know they could work with each other. Um, so other things in here what that, that means, though, is, is in terms of that prep time, your collective knowledge of Microsoft technologies also plays a huge role in how much time you need to put into preparing for exam exams, as well as how quickly you can finish exams, because extended knowledge of Microsoft technologies means you are going to be eliminating so many of the multiple choice distractor answers without even thinking about it, uh, because you go, that's dumb, that's dumb, that's dumb, that's completely irrelevant, it was discontinued 15 years ago, whereas somebody who doesn't have that background will go, oh, that, you know, that thing that you thought was, you know, is discontinued 15 years ago, someone goes, oh, the name of that thing looks like a pretty close match to the thing that they're, they're asking. Um, so don't be, you know, don't be surprised by, you know, things that you haven't thought about for years helping you answer exam questions. Okay, um, so Mark, I'm going to be completely honest. I'm, yep. I'm waiting for it, for Microsoft to reuse the SBS moniker. Oh, I'm sure it will. It's going to happen. It's got to happen because, like, we've, we've brought out SMS again. So... How about the storage broke storage broker service? Yep, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to start a Twitter campaign on that. <laughs> yeah. No, that that would just bring some really angry people back out of the woodwork. But let's just leave them leave them in the woodwork. That, that, that's okay. We can then just start yeah. talking about media server yeah, and media yeah. PC. Oh, and Windows Home Server as well. Yeah, but that's really just a variation of the SBS conversation. Okay, so let's just, let's quickly talk about fundamentals exams in general before we get into the more specific exams. So fundamentals exams, fantastic, mostly. Um, they're not supposed to be technical exams, but there can be um, technical elements in some of them. Now, the worst offender, I'll, I'll sort of focus the conversation on three, the Azure fundamentals, Microsoft 365 fundamentals, and the security, uh, SC900 security compliance identity uh, fundamentals. MS900 is has traditionally been probably the worst of those exams in terms of not really telling you what you need to know before you go in and do the exam. Now, it's gotten better over time, but generally with fundamentals exams, the idea is you need to know what a technology does but not really anything about how to use it, how to deploy it, how to manage it, et cetera. Um, so in a lot of cases, it ends up being, you know, a word association game. So if it says workflow, it's probably Power Automate, that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but sometimes like with MS-900, yeah, basically it is buzzword. But MS-900 was one that, like I mentioned earlier, that we was like, we, we this was one that we just saw like atrocious failure rates on that one. So. Like with some of the, when we're sort of doing some, like back in the days of doing, when we're doing like in-person large group exam proctoring, like for AZ900 people, like I'd say we were probably getting like 90 to 95% pass rates, but MS900 was, I'd say we were lucky if we hit 50% on a regular basis. Um, and it was it was the exam itself. It was. It wasn't. It was not the individuals. It's the exam's gotten a lot better. There's still a few things in it that are a little bit kind of you know, iffy, as far as my opinion is concerned. There. Now, should you do fundamentals exams? Do them if you want to. If your employer funds them, do them. Uh, if you want to learn about it or learn a little bit about a technology that uh, you know that you've been meaning to look at but you haven't been incredibly motivated. Yeah, just sort of go do the, the fundamental uh, learning path on learn and get your way through it that way. So use it as a way to sort of fill in some of the gaps. So things that people might expect you to know something about without it being your area of expertise. Uh, and you know, fundamentals exams, uh, it, like Microsoft doesn't really release the stats of things, 
But I would say that um, I would have to guess that fundamentals exams are a very, like as a collective, are a very significant portion of the exams that people take uh, on a monthly or annual basis, for example. Um, just just because of the because they're not just targeting people with uh, with technical backgrounds. Now, general feedback that you get from fundamentals exams, which proves that both groups of users are lying. Um, people who are technical will complain that there's too much licensing in it, and people who are licensing or sales focused will complain that the exams are too technical. Both of those things cannot be, you know, cannot be true. Um, or they'll come out going, oh, it was 90% licensing. And it's like, no. Knowing what is different between Microsoft 365, E3, and E5, that is not a licensing question. That is a knowing components of a product question. Um, and yeah, but the but SC900 and MS, sorry, SC900 and AZ900 are very, very clear about what you need to know in order to pass the exam. I've got a description of MS 900 that I, I wrote myself coming up that will, will help you to get a better understanding of that one. So for the modern desktop exams, so the Windows client exam, so remember with, with that MD 100, like that is a, like that is an exam where I swear I have seen the questions in that exam in Windows in Windows 8 exams, Windows 7 exams, Vista exams, XP exams, Windows 2000 exams, going back through NT exams as well. Because it's a lot of the stuff is just core Windows client stuff. Now, obviously, there, it's not, you know, it also has some Windows 10 specific stuff in there. Uh, but think of it that it, it was mostly around on prem and traditional, but more cloud based stuff is slowly rolling into it. Now, the Managing Modern Desktop MD101, this is pretty good in terms of it is what, yeah, it's mostly what you think it's going to be, uh, but it's not purely a cloud exam. And I think this is just that general, um, you know, people going, oh, you know, modern desktops is cloud only. And it's like, not, not necessarily. It's only cloud only if you want it to be cloud only. So sometimes people forget that there could be some stuff around AD, group policy, MDT, et cetera, in there. But that's really a pretty small part of the exam overall. It's your, um, basically it's, if you think about things that you're doing inside of the endpoint manager console, that's what, yeah. So by saying that, that means that, you know, bringing in some of the, uh, yeah, the um, defender for endpoint, some of the Azure AD stuff, et cetera, that really is the big focus of this exam. So that one, you know, that one, you know, pretty much does tick tick all the boxes. Now for the MS nine hundred, the fundamentals exam. Um, what does this exam test you on? Basically, anything and everything that can be part of a Microsoft three six five enterprise subscription, anything you can add to an E five subscription, and anything that an E five subscription can connect to. <laughs> so not much to that one. Um, so this one, everyone who comes out of this exam is basically going, oh, I didn't even know what this particular thing was that they were talking about. Thankfully, people are passing it though. So a lot of the really, really bad questions from early on. So to give you an example of one of the questions that was in there a long time ago, um, and I was like, what? Um, he was asking for details as to how you would get people inside, you know, a small group of users inside the organization onto Office Insider builds instead of uh, just using semi-annual channel, for example. So, you know, and answers included, you know, which, you know, what entries should you be putting into a config.xml file and stuff like that. And that, yeah, you know, and just Office Insider in general. Most people wouldn't have even known what that was, yet alone anything specific that it was like, oh no, Intune's not gonna offer it to you natively. Uh, Config Manager's not gonna offer it to you natively. Uh, yeah, you don't get a drop down in the client UI to pick that. That's something where you actually have to handcraft it. So, so this one was, you know, was a really, really, really terrible exam when it first came out, but it has gotten a lot better. Now, MS100 has started to shift to be a more all encompassing um, Azure AD and Office 365 and Power Platform exam. Now, when I first, when I did an early version of this exam, it really, for me, it was like, oh, fantastic. Like it ended up being mostly an Azure AD premium exam. So it's like fantastic stuff I can do in my sleep. 
Um, but over time, it started to get more of the, like the Office Collab workload and Power Platform stuff in there. So anyone who goes in saying, I know identity, but I don't know 0365 or Power Platform, it's going to be harder to get through that exam without having a bit more exposure there. Now, MS-101 is um, basically takes this to the next level. Instead of it being an Office 365, you know, an AAD and Office 365 exam, this one magically becomes a Microsoft 365 exam because it also expects you to know Windows and EMS. So this, so this one is obviously one that's going to be a lot more comfortable for, uh, for, uh, for most of you. Now, MS-500 has got a ridiculous amount of overlap with MS-101. So if somebody's preparing for one or the other, I would say you're actually preparing for both. So the challenge that I had was MS, so I did the beat of MS 100 and 101 within like a week or so of each other. And then a few weeks later, MS 500 came out. And the problem that I had with prepping for MS 500 was because it was like so many of the objectives overlapped, it was really hard for me to get motivated to prepare for it because I'd already looked at all that content on docs and I just didn't really want to keep reading the same stuff over and over. Um, and even in terms of a lot of the questions, there was similarity. Well, well now, it, now the difference, there's a bit more of a difference in there, um, but it's, yeah, but it's still close enough to MS 101 that I think it's, you know, I'd sort of say these are, they're definitely two exams you should be grouping in with each other. Now, MS 700, why have I got a Teams exam in here? Uh, because you probably will need to know something about Teams at some point, even if you don't believe you will need to. Uh, uh, no people chance. Will just... Don't want to know anything about Teams. <laughs> yeah. Remove it off all yeah. the computers. Send the uninstall command. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and this... No, I'm not going to go down that no, joke. Sorry. And so, and probably the like the big driving thing here that's really critical is like this is especially true if you work for a Microsoft partner. Microsoft, you know, uh, yeah, Teams. Yeah, people ask, you know, why does Microsoft push Teams so hard? Um, it's because if they can get people using Teams, that has locked Office 365 into use in that organization. That means Microsoft 365 is more than likely locked in. And the and the um, the Microsoft 365 part really starts coming through the Azure AD premium piece because all you all of your governance and compliance stuff in Teams uh, are, you know around you know groups uh, group expiration uh, group naming etc all of that is Azure AD so so it, it's another exam where you know I, I wouldn't say you could bluff your way through this exam if you knew nothing about Teams and knew a lot about Azure AD you'd probably still get a pretty good score through guessing. But you may, it probably wouldn't be enough to, uh, to pass it, though. Um, now, the, the final one I've got on here for MS is MS 600. This one I've got in here is a bit of a wild card. So even though this is a developer exam and is good, Liam, are you still on, Liam? I think I'm pretty sure Liam is still on. Yep. Um, so you're in the same category as me. You're not a developer, uh, but you, you, did this, you did this exam as well, though, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I did this one, I think, yeah. last year. Yeah, when you were with your previous employer. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so with this exam, the thing that I really liked about this was, you know, normally I would not, like, I normally I'd try to avoid anything dev-focused dev like the plague. But this one's actually kind of good for you to sort of, you know, to fill in a few gaps around, um, you know, like when people are sort of talking about customizing teams, building, you know, building add-ins, et cetera, uh, and just getting a bit of an idea of how things work under the covers. Uh, like, and this one's also got you know, uh, Microsoft Graph stuff in it as well. So, so this one I sort of got in there as a bit of a wild card uh, for somebody who is that way inclined. And look, in reality, if you've ever done anything around like SharePoint deployment, or sorry, SharePoint um, development or any kind of Office, app, uh, office add-in development, this exam would be, you know, should be something you can do in your sleep. I'd say even if I didn't prepare for this exam, I probably would have still gotten somewhere around 500 to 600 out of 1,000 on it, just based on knowing what SharePoint framework was and what different, you know, what different teams, uh, teams add-ons did, et cetera. Um, and then it's just sort of focusing on a few of the other things. But there's like very few code, you know, actual pure code-based questions, and even those that are in there, okay, as long as you can read it and process it, 
uh, yeah, the chances are you can probably figure it out. Now onto some of the newer exams. So the security and compliance exams, SC 900, um, unlike MS 900, I've got no reservations about recommending this to people. If you go through the exam objectives and go, okay, you know, and basically you know what things are, you know what the terminology is, you know what the different technologies do, this should be an exam that you get through uh, without, without too much issue. Now, where I can see that people are going to struggle with this exam is people who are sort of pushed into this who just don't work in the security and compliance space. So, so if someone's just like a generalist and doesn't know security terminology, um, you know, and they're sort of seeing terms like SIEM and SOAR and XDR, et cetera, that's going to make this exam a lot tougher. But as long as people can memorize what those terms mean, you, you know, you, you're well on your way with this one. Now, SC200, another fantastic exam. Um, uh, it's the weighting, it's something like around 35% of the weighting of the exam is Microsoft 365 Defender related, and the other 65% is Azure related through Azure Defender for Cloud and through Sentinel, sorry, Microsoft Defender for Cloud and Microsoft Sentinel. Um, so it's heavily weighted toward, you know, that somebody who knows the Azure side of it, so someone who knows KQL, log analytics, subscription, you know, Azure subscription details, et cetera, uh, they'd be able to get through this exam without too much trouble. Somebody without the Azure side, so yeah, so basically no Sentinel, no uh, cloud, uh, Defender for Cloud. Um, you know, you've got you've got a lot more work to do to get through it, but I'd say it's still achievable. And things like KQL, basically your advanced hunting in uh, over in you know, Microsoft 365 security uh, portal. Yeah, you're using KQL there as well. So the skills you're acquiring for it do apply to M365. And then even some of your M365 knowledge is going to carry over into some of the Sentinel questions uh, because they do tend to focus on things like the Office 365 uh, or you know, so the Office 365 and Defender uh, connectors, et cetera. Now, SC300 is the reason why I'm not too upset about what's happened to MS100. So MS100 was mostly an identity exam, but now it's identity and a ton of other stuff. SC300 is the identity exam. If you know Azure AD premium functionality, you are going to pass this exam. I'm not going to say guaranteed because I'm not that stupid, <laughs> um, but the thing that isn't going to be in it, uh, I, actually, I won't say money back guarantee, um, but the thing that does catch people out a little bit with this exam. It's only a small part of it, so it's not that big a deal, but it's where the Azure, uh, where the Azure AD piece starts shifting into app registrations as opposed to just using the built-in apps. So when you're building your own apps in Azure and choosing uh, how you're gonna be using the uh, Microsoft Identity Platform to make your apps available multi-tenant, that's, that's the thing that, you know, that if somebody doesn't prepare, if someone only knows the Azure AD stuff through Microsoft 365. That's the that's probably the main area that they'll get caught out. But also the Sentinel integration. It's really just saying where do you want the you know where do you want the audit logs etc. Sent. Uh, so if you know how to do that in the Azure portal, yeah, pretty simple stuff. Now the MIP one. <laughs> um, I hated this exam, but this is falling into the category of things that I have no passion for. So governance, information protection, compliance. Uh, oh, yawn. Um, <laughs> you know, if people say to me, oh, can you come in and talk to us about security and compliance? And it's like, I'll talk to you about the first one. <laughs> the second part, I'll fall asleep halfway through the sentence. Um, just, yeah, and that's just my personal thing. I just, it just doesn't excite me uh, terribly. Uh, so obviously, because it's not the thing I'm passionate about, it was the exam that I did find a lot tougher. And even as I sort of was doing the exam, like I did struggle uh, to get through that one. And I think another part of the reason for that is why this one in particular is like, I'm not, like I'm not incredibly motivated when it comes to Office 365. Because for me, Office 365 is the thing I would have expected you to have before you got me involved in a conversation around Intune. Uh, so, uh, so you know, or EMS. So it's like, well, I don't, I don't have to talk to you about that stuff because that should be the stuff you already know. But this exam, because we talk about information protection inside of collaboration workloads, you know, underlying Office 365 knowledge does help. But yeah, but if that's the thing you need to do, uh, you know, 
So I should, basically, I need, I'll need to mute all of that out because I don't want to upset Macca. <laughs> Macca, Mark said that information protection is really dull and boring. Sorry, I'm not going to. I'll just give him the <laughs> video. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Macca. Okay. Yeah. Now, for, for Azure exams, Azure Fundamentals exam, two thumbs up. Uh, what they tell you you're going to be tested on are the things you are going to be tested on. The MS Learn content uh, aligns really well with that. Um, and this is the one that even off the top of my head now, I could probably do a pretty good job of giving you all of the word association tips you need to pass this exam. <laughs> um, yeah, even though like I had to do, I basically hadn't run that course for probably a year and a half. But then as soon as I looked at the content again a few weeks ago when I had to do a one-off delivery, it was like, oh, okay, I still remember all of my hints and tips for it. Now, Azure Admin, uh, this one was kind of interesting for me, seeing who was passing this exam and who was failing it when we had groups of people uh, in a room for online proctoring and they were all doing this one exam. Uh, generally speaking, those who had had more experience with on-prem AD were passing the exam and those who were DevOps focused were not passing the exam even though the exam had scripting questions, et cetera, in it. And the reason was um, basically it, the skills that were taken in before they started prepping for the exam. So, the, so if you think about an on-prem AD admin, do they know stuff about TCP IP? Do they know DNS, et cetera? So yes, they know a lot of that, you know, things that are important parts of infrastructure as a service are just things that, you know, even though you may not have been managing them with that role you had, you still had to know enough about them to be able to communicate clearly with people inside your organization. Now, how was I able to, now, this is not to offend anyone. This is just a question that I, this is a question that I alluded to earlier that I've been asked repeatedly and I know how to respond to it. What's that slash 26 after that number on screen? And my response to that is, uh, so, so you're DevOps, aren't you? Bit, bit so, mask. Yeah. So I'd say, and I'd say, oh, you're DevOps, aren't you? And they're like, yeah, yeah. How can you tell? Because, and that, and that was really it. It was because they. So even if they had been you been deploying networks and using that stuff, they were, you know, basically, you know, in DevOps, you don't need to know all of the things that you're deploying. It's just, you know, as long as you can find out how to format things, yeah, you know, how to make the ARM templates work in Azure, you know, you're good to go. Um, so the people who didn't have as much Azure exposure, the skills that they had were way more transferable to what this exam was testing on because this exam did really start off very heavily as an IaaS exam. Um, so it used to be a, it used to be a two a two part exam. There was AZ100 and AZ102, sorry, 100 and 101. And when they sort of stripped it back to 103 to make it a single exam because of that, you know, people want single exam for certification, pretty much everything PAS was stripped out and it ended up being almost purely IaaS. Um, and AZ-104 when it started was still mostly IaaS. So someone who knew you know, virtual machines, virtual networking, virtual storage, uh, and something about AD, not even Azure AD, they were probably 60 to 70% of their way getting through that, uh, through that exam. Now, AZ-500, identity is around a third of the exam score. <laughs> But again, things like app registrations, not just your Azure AD knowledge through uh, Microsoft 365. Uh, but if you've got, if you know basics about things like network security groups, network appliances, et cetera, um, and the Azure AD stuff, you're well on your way to passing this exam. Uh, but this exam is getting a lot broader than it uh, than it used to be. So I think when I did the exam, it was like 30% Azure AD, uh, and then roughly 70% network security <laughs> groups. Um, and they were, the network security group questions were so pay, so painful. Um, but now it's, it's expanded. There's like a lot more uh, Defender for Cloud, Sentinels in there, more log analytics. So this is one that I'd, I'd say is kind of probably not too much of a stretch for a lot of people who are in, in the modern desktop space. Uh, there is going to be a lot of overlap. Now, I won't worry about the architect exams too much here, uh, just because the you know they're in flux at the moment. There's the, um, but basically 303 and 304 are being retired and 305 will be the architect exam 
But in order to get the architect certification, you also need to have the 104. And 104 gets you the administrator, then 104 plus 305 will get you the, um, uh, the architect uh, certification. Now, the good thing here is that like what I found, whether it was 301 and 302, sorry, 300 and 301 or 303 and 304, was I always found it tougher to prepare for that second exam because there's so much overlap with other things you've looked at, even though it's patterns and practices and, you know, uh, and, you know, it's architecture designs at a higher level, it, like it got increasingly tougher to prepare for that. Um, and it was almost like then when I went in and did the exams, any of the prep that I did didn't really matter because it was stuff that was in a lot of cases, kind of common sense architectural designs anyway. Um, but I did the 305 beta a few weeks back and it, it was more of the same, um, like no, no real complaints. I didn't have to type things in all caps about them, not understanding the difference between Azure AD join and hybrid Azure AD join. And final Azure exam, uh, actually, no, I've got bonus ones coming up after this one. So AZ100, Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, I went into this on the assumption that I could block my way through it without ever having deployed Azure Virtual Desktop myself, uh, just based on what I'd read about it and my Azure knowledge. I'm pleased to report that I was correct. <laughs> um, the, but if, but if you sort of got a more granular breakdown of the scores, it would basically show probably, you know, the vast majority of the questions I got wrong with like the pure AVD questions. Anything where it was AVD plus other, other Azure services, I, you know, I just sort of sailed through those. But anything that was specifically AVD functionality, it's like, I don't know, I've never used it. Um, and, you know, that's the perfect example of, you know, got a free exam voucher. So, you know, why not try it, get it out of the way? Um, but this exam, so so what I'm saying there about the Azure skills pulling me through, this is the kind of the feedback that you get from somebody who only focused on AVD and didn't know much about Azure. They would be complaining about the amount of Azure that you needed to know for this exam. Uh, but yeah, so Steve, kind of like the old 703 config manager exam. People, the con people who loved config manager only complained about the Azure and Intune inclusions but I passed that exam because of the Azure and Intune. I only passed that exam because of Azure and Intune. The, the 703 exam was awesome. It was yeah. a great exam. I don't know what you're talking about there, Mark. Oh, no, I liked it. I liked it because I, I, I had I quite enjoyed Azure it, and Intune though, in it. Even though the first iteration was all about um, uh, the old Intune engine, not the new Intune engine. So remember when I did that exam, that, so this was an exam I did as a trophy hunting exercise. So I could get a certification that was about to retire when that exam retired. So I basically did a last minute push. And I think it was, it was when one of the Ignite events was happening in Sydney. I think I wandered up to the test center and did it, then went back down. And then you, and then you laughed at me because it, like it took me like 20 or 25 minutes and it only took you 15 or 20 minutes to do it. No, no, that was the previous one. Oh, okay. So the CMO7 exam, uh, it took me 15 minutes, including a computer crash up on the Gold oh. Coast. <laughs> okay. I held the record so, that year for the quickest yes. exam. So coming up, final slide for the night. The two exams I was supposed to do on the weekend that I looked at the exam description for and said, I don't think so. Now, I'm not saying they're bad exams. They're just not exams that interest me completely. And the reason is the things that I like in these exams are things I can get from other exams. So let's take a look. What are the things I think are good about these exams? Oh, Azure, Azure AD, Azure Arc, Log Analytics, Azure Arc, awesome. Azure, Sentinel, Defender for Cloud, Backup, Site Recovery, VM Migration. So the Azure stuff I like, but this is where those retired Windows Server exams have gone. So if you take a look at the exam descriptions for these, um, as soon as I went through the first full, first full bullet points on this one, I started suffering from PTSD, had to close the browser session, 
come back a little bit later, get into the exam registration site and cancel both registrations because it's like, I do not want to go back into that world. Uh, because things like transferring FISMO roles, et cetera, is this like, yeah, so this is, so again, going back to that 20 year ago, so that, yeah, so that decades ago technologies conversation, that is where this exam would take me back to. And if you take so a look at the- The interesting yeah. one on that, um, that researching and studying will be painful is DNS. So DNS architecture, yeah. um, the docs weren't updated after 2003. Yeah, you'd have to go back into all of the old, uh, you basically, yeah, you've got to hope that you get a good search result inside of docs uh, because you're not going to be able to rely on anything else. Um, but, but overall, I think for somebody who is making the step you know, and sort of looking at integration, like actually quite, I think it's actually a really good set of things that they do test, but it's, I had to make a, it's, I just did not want to put any time into AD, Hyper-V, storage spaces direct. Like those are things that like going back a few years when there was a part of going back, like for the server 2012 and server 2016 timeframe, there was a part of Microsoft that was still paying me to know stuff about server. But once that agreement stopped, I, I did not struggle letting go of Windows Server because that, that was the thing that basically, it was already off, like it was already dead for me, but then it had to go back onto life support. It had magical resurrection. Um, and, it's, and I'm not saying anything negative about the technologies or the exams. Um, like the exam, just the things that are in the exam, I think they've got some really good stuff in there on the cloud side so that, you know, good stuff for the on-prem people to learn, but, you know, having, you know, moved mostly to cloud you know, a decade ago kind of thing, it's like, oh, that's, yeah, I don't want to relearn things I have actively tried to forget. <laughs> but they, but look, they, so, and I, I already know, like, People who are Windows Server focused are going to complain that there's too much Azure in this, these exams. And it's like, well, that's why they are called hybrid exams. Um, and, I was, and for me, because I didn't look at the description before I booked in uh, the betas, I made a lot of assumptions around it. I thought it would mostly be the, the Azure piece. I didn't realize how heavily on-prem they would still be. Uh, so that's, that's the reason why I didn't, like, I just don't want to invest time. I'm sure there's probably something where I've got to learn about, you know, LSAS and Kerberos again, and I don't, I don't want to have to do those things. Um, I, I would hope that they're going to be uh, asking questions about how to set up Hello for Business. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think that's, that was in there. Yeah. Good. See, but that's the thing is like any of the stuff that you or I would find interesting, or most of the people on the call, you know, stuff that you would find interesting, um, like if we take a look, so things like Azure Arc, uh, I think this is probably the first place this is showing up, but I'm pretty sure you'll start seeing that show up in other Azure exams. Log analytics is all over the place. Defender for cloud is all over the place. Uh, you know, the, you know, def, you know, Sentinel, like we've got multiple exams that cover that already. So, so for somebody who wants Max. to extend from on-prem into the cloud, I think this is great. But for somebody who's already cloud, this is, if, if this stuff is still fresh for you, I'm pretty sure you'd probably get through it without a problem. But if, but I, di I just don't want to have to relearn things. I've got, like, I try to have hobbies outside of technology and they do not include relearning what the different FISMO roles are. Okay, so that's it. So that's the final question. So I think this is the first time I've actually canceled exams in a while. Um, so I thought it would be better to cancel them than to not turn up. Uh, I don't know what the difference would actually be in terms of records, but um, yeah, it was, I just sort of looked at it and said, I, I should have actually looked at the descriptions before I registered, uh, but it was, yeah, just not, not for me, but there's probably plenty of people that I will recommend these to moving forward. And that's really the final, final one. So we actually had a, a long session. Yeah, we do today. Certification. So have Ooh, I made it certified? Caused more confusion for people with this stuff. Not for me, but I'm probably not the target audience. Liam, you came off mute there. 
Yeah, I was going to say, no, it was a good session. Yeah, so this is, so you can probably tell, this This is basically what my life is at, at the moment. <laughs> And I don't, I don't mind it because I kind of got a core set of ex a core set of courses slash exams that I have to deal with. I don't get random requests to do things that are things that I don't have any interest or knowledge about. So, so that's why I can sort of talk about this these ones uh, without concern of running out of words. Indeed. Yeah, so basically the whole renewed interest in Microsoft certifications, it basically means that I, I don't do any consulting at all these days. Everything is just training or exam prep. Nice. Yeah, which means that I don't have to take phone calls after hours. I don't get people sending me support related emails. It's a <laughs> it's a wonderful change. Yes, you, you can stop as soon as the call finishes. Correct. And, and completely forget about what you're talking about for the whole day. Yeah, and then I just have to quickly refresh things in the morning before the day kicks off. I oh, know Liam knows all my secrets now, <laughs> but I think Liam probably figured a lot of that stuff out already. <laughs> I was going to say, when I when I do um, the exams now, like a lot of the stuff, like a lot of the techniques that, you know, you had sort of just explained to the room back in like the 346 and 347 days are still very just relevant and they the more there's a little bit of a skill which is not in the technology itself but in picking apart the question and the answers and yeah. Yeah. being able to like get a bit of a boost where you otherwise maybe wouldn't if you, you know, if it's like your first or second time going into an exam. But is it, so am I remembering correctly, was it you who, who put a whole bunch of effort into learning like PowerShell over a Christmas period or something like that because of 347? Was that, was uh, that you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I bought, I bought yeah. a book, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but, but 347, yeah, but yeah, 347 was such a nightmare exam. Um, and it was... And I think it was because it was the first time a lot of people did have PowerShell exposure. And I, I remember the um, the link PowerShell questions they asked where it was like, you know, scripts that were 30 lines long <laughs> and like 20 missing pieces and you had to choose, you know, choose the correct commandlet, choose the correct switches and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, none of the people who were doing this exam have ever used Skype for business online <laughs> or at least done anything through PowerShell. Yeah. So it was, yeah, it, it's one of those things where the their aspirations for who the exam takers were did not match reality. Hmm. I, I remember the, like, when those boot camp things were happening, a lot of the room were people like me that were coming from basically small business server. Yeah. Um, and I remember talking to... Um, Someone, I was on the way home from like the 347 one, and you know, it was like a lot of PowerShell. Um, and the response I got, and this was a, a guy that had been like, I'd been using Small Business Server for I don't know five years or something, like 2011 was going out of style when I started, <laughs> and um, the, the response that I got following was like, well, nobody's going to use it because everyone's using the GUI now. <laughs> Were you, was it, the, was it, so there was a session in Melbourne where somebody asked, what's a PowerShell? Were you in that one? Um, Maybe, I think I was in like, I was in the, I think it was like 2016 when it was kind of like the first round of those. Yeah, because Sarah, camps. because yeah, because I was up the front and Sarah Arnold was in the back of the room just sort of doing doing work on her laptop. And when the person asked that question, she just sort of did a, <laughs> and it's like, okay, there's someone else who's not going to pass this exam. But I think it, but that was something where there were, where people were sending the wrong people to training for the wrong exams. Yeah. Yeah. I remember one of the other things that Sarah had said was, um, uh, I think somebody somebody asked about small business server specifically, or basically like when when was 
2012 can I get small business server? And um, <laughs> I, I think the response was basically, if you look around this room, you will see the only other people that care about small business server. Nobody outside yeah. of Australia used it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even here, so actually let me, let me hit stop on recording for this next conversation. It's, I'm not going to say anything bad. So those of you who are watching the recording, don't worry. It's just that there are, are names I might use that I don't want coming back to haunt me. So I'll just hit stop recording. <laughs>